All right, folks. So we can get started now. Um, um, welcome, everyone. My name is David Yang. I'm a mathematics instructor at Fresno City College, and I'll be uh, moderating the uh, webinar today um, to help us learn about our panelists. Um, and so I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, during Asian American uh, Month here, we uh, the uh, the Asian American Faculty Staff Association at Fresno City College likes to put on this uh, panel to help us learn more about um, other uh, faculty members in the district um, and to really learn about how they got here and, um, you know, how they, um, um, and what they can share with us about their experiences. So with us today um, for our panel, we have, uh, Dr. Kirpreet uh, Bogal. She's the director for the Title uh, for Title Five at Reedley College. Um, we have John Yang, uh, senior program specialist uh, at Madeira College. Uh, Tang Dong, Tang Zhang, a librarian at Fresno City College, and uh, Lorraine Doria, at uh, history instructor here at Fresno City College as well. And as you guys can see, um, just from you know their titles, we have a wide range of uh, representation from. Uh, different areas and uh, different um, colleges, and so um, hopefully this will help us learn more about you know what it what what they're all doing at uh, the at our district and also um, how they got here. Now, just um, a little bit of uh, kind of housekeeping things. Um, we do have a Q and A um, um, that you guys can type in questions into. Um, those questions may be answered by the panelists themselves if you're addressing someone or if you have a question for the um, whole panel, the, those questions may be addressed um, towards the end um, when we will have a um, question and answer session. And also, um, due to time constraints, um, we may not be able to hear um, responses from all of the panelists for each of the questions. Um, but if we do have time, then um, we'll try to get to um, everyone's response, but just to kind of um, put that out there so that we're all aware of that. So um, to start, I'd like to have each of the panelists uh, share um, us with us their journey to um, the State Center Community College District, and then how that journey has shaped them to be where they are today. And so we're going to start with uh, uh, with Dr. Gurpreet Bogal. Thank you. All right, so let's see, my journey. Um, I want to say everything kind of just fell into place and brought me to where I'm at today. Um, I moved out to the Central Valley back in March 2016, so I'm not originally from here. I was from Southern California, and in Southern California, I was a part of a K-12 district and as well as an adult school. And so I kind of always knew I wanted to help students within education. And when I came here, first thing I did, I started applying for, you know, the K-12s and the adult school, had many interviews, didn't get offered any positions. And so I thought, well, I've worked with community colleges before at the adult school. Let me try State Center. So I applied at State Center and I made it to the top of a list for the 083 position. My first interview, didn't get the job. And so I walked out a little disheartened, um, but immediately I got an email offering me another interview because you know how they go down that list and send it to different departments. Um, and so I went for that next interview and I was offered a position with Disabled Students Programs and Services at Fresno City College. Um, being within that program, one of the things that I had known that I wanted to eventually do, I just didn't have the, um, I guess, I could say, uh, I didn't think I could do it. I wanted to be a counselor, but I didn't think I was cut out to be a counselor, uh, go into that master's program and be accepted. Um, so my self-confidence in that area was a little low, but a lot of our colleagues there, they really encouraged me. And one of the colleagues that I worked with at the time, um, she kind of talked me through it, like just apply, see what happens, gave me a reference to call and talk to over at the program. And so that following year in 20. Uh, 17. I was accepted into the master's program for clinical rehabilitation and mental health counseling. Um, I started that program when my daughter was only three months old. And so it was difficult. She was little. I was juggling full-time work, full-time school, and taking care of her at the same time. And uh, I completed. I was an intern on our campus at Fresno City. And by 2019, September 2019, once I had finished my 
um, internship and all was going well, I was offered a full-time role. So I had started applying and I got a full-time counselor coordinator role at DSPNS over at Reedley College. Transitioned over into 2020 and I knew that that temporary position was coming to an end. So started applying again, fell into a coordinator role for a Title V grant and slowly transitioned over to eventually being a director and getting my doctoral. I started that in 2020 um, at the height of the pandemic. And I found out I was pregnant that same month. So again, the challenges of full-time work, navigating with two children at this point through the program and full-time school. Um, and here I am. Thank you. Um, John, would you like to go next? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my journey to State Center started uh, off actually being a, a student aid worker. Uh, specifically a tutor for the Fresno City College Upward Bound program. Uh, so that was <clears throat> when I was doing my undergraduate degree uh, at Fresno State. I was a business major and really just torn between what I would do with my degree in business management. And I had worked uh, like various uh, restaurant jobs and, and finally decided that I needed a change of scenery. And so it just so happened that I found a job posting to become a tutor for the Upper Bound program at Fresno City College and decided to give it a try. Um, and that was when I really learned and realized that you could work um, at a college campus. So prior to that, you know, it was just, uh, my trajectory was right to get my business degree and then go be uh, like an assistant manager, eventually a general manager somewhere. I had no idea that working for a college campus was a possibility. And so through the tutoring job, um, I was exposed to the college campus environment in a way that I had not been before, even as a college student myself. I got to tour uh, through the program. I got to visit many different colleges throughout California, the CSUs and the UCs. I learned more about the application process, the requirements. Um, and this was all, you know, because I, I was also helping and tutoring current high school students to help them prepare for their journey into higher education. And so I did that for about two years. It was very profound work, very life-changing work that uh, really broadened my perspective about what kind of jobs and careers were out there. And so in the two years that I was with Upper Bound as a tutor, uh, I knew that eventually this is the kind of work that I wanted to do. And so fortunate for me, when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, uh, the person that was working full-time in the Upper Bound program as the senior program specialist, uh, she was actually from Chico. And so she was wanted to go back home and and so took an opportunity back in Chico. And so this opportunity opened up and because I had worked for the program for two years and they were looking for someone to at least come in and fill in the position temporarily. And I at least met the minimum requirements with the experience and the bachelor's degree, I was able to transition into that position. And so fast forward, uh, you know, 10 years later, um, I'm now here at Madera College working in the student activities department. So doing very similar work, um, helping to you know build activities and create activities for the student body, which is very similar to what I did with Upward Bound. So a lot of it was exposing our students to um, opportunities and to activities that would enrich them and allow them to grow individually uh, and also as a student and help them just to be successful in all aspects of their lives throughout their academic journey. And so now being here at State Center or being here at Madera Community College, I you know I get to do very similar work. Um, I get to be on the college campus. I'm also the advisor for the student government here at Madera College. And so uh, all of the mentoring and all of the getting to work with the younger population, the student population, uh, the skills that I gained working in Upper Bound, I've been able to translate that into my new role here uh, at Madera College. And so ultimately, if it wasn't for that tutoring job, um, I don't think I would be here today. If it wasn't for uh, my coworker or my supervisor at the time who had get, you know called me up to present me with the opportunity, uh, I might not be here uh, today because interestingly, right around the time that I was being offered the temporary job uh, for Upward Bound as a full-time staff member, um, I had also applied, you know, as a, as a recently graduated uh, business uh, management student to work for uh, State Farm Insurance as a sales agent. And so, uh, I was offered both jobs at the same time, and 
made a decision, chose Fresno City College, and uh, it's changed my life, I think, for the better. It's, I think, fulfilled me in ways that I don't think the other opportunity would have. And so to this day, I'm, I'm grateful for that, uh, kind of that split moment in my life, and that's how I got to where I, I am today. Thanks, John. And I'm sure your uh, students appreciate you not trying to sell them on insurance anyways and, <laughs> and working with them instead. <laughs> um, so Lorraine, how about you? Can you share with us your journey? Um, yes, uh, I grew up as a, mil a military kid. My father was in the U.S. Army, um, lived base life for a while until my parents settled down in California, East Bay, Union City, uh, went to UC Davis, and uh, I never thought I'd be in education. Um, I was a good Asian child. My parents planned out my future. I was supposed to be a doctor, and I was uh, doing the um, chemistry calculus series, a uh, first year uh, pre-med student at Davis, and I was miserable. I was so unhappy. And um, one of the extra credit assignments uh, was to go to those speakers available uh, for school. So um, I picked the one that offered food and it was to hear Don Mabalan speak. And it, changed my life because I finally saw someone who looked like me and she was a Filipino American and she used the same terms that I used at home, like a uh, Lolo Lola, meaning um grandmother, grandfather, um Tia. And I was like, I did not even know that I could do this. So uh I, I remembered switching my major it was uh, the week before going home for Thanksgiving and my heart was beating so fast and I was so scared. I'm, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my parents I'm not going to be a doctor and I'm going to switch majors and go into history. Uh, but I did it. I uh, came home and told my parents, made my father cry. I, I've never seen him cry before. He was horrified how I was going to feed myself. Um, I did the whole adjunct thing for a while while getting uh, while finishing up my master's, taught at um, San Joaquin Delta College and Merced College. I uh, saw an opening for Fresno City College. This is actually my first year, just my second semester as a history instructor. And it was um, on an un unexpected journey. Um, I can feed myself, my father, so happy about that. But uh, I, I think I found a place where I was meant to be. It sounds really cheesy, but it, it feels like this is a right fit and a place for me. Everyone has been so nice and welcoming, and it's really great hearing stories like Gurpreet and John that... We set out a path that we didn't think we would be, and and here we are. So um, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. Yeah, and thank you, Lorraine. Yeah, definitely. Um, we haven't got a chance to say this. So welcome to Fresno City College. You know, it's been your second semester, but yeah, I I totally agree with you with your sentiment of feeling welcomed and um and actually having the Asian American Faculty Staff Association is a is a, another way to kind of deepen your connection with faculty and staff and the, the campus as a whole. So uh, thank you. And I see that you've already taken on a role in our association as well. So, you know, thank you for, for taking that extra step as well. Um, all right, Tank, can you help us? Uh, can you help share your journey with us? All right, so hello, everyone. Um, so began my journey uh, growing up as a first generation Hmong American. I noticed that there was a lack of representation uh, among educational mentors from grade school going through about all the way until my undergrad. Um, and it was through this observation that it helped inspired me to pursue a career in librarianship. And this actually didn't even occur <laughs> until the very last semester while I was going to be completing my bachelor's over at CSU Stan, where I decided to take on this role just because it was so fulfilling for librarianship. Um, 
And so during that time, I, I chose librarianship because it helped enabled me to combine my passions uh, with my profession. So creating a fulfilling career, you know, dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, uh, to address societal needs, and to promote lifelong learning. So whether it's assisting patrons with the research or students or faculty members or anyone else, or whether it be advocating for inclusiveness within the workforce, um, organizing educational programs or advocating for intellectual freedom, um, I believe that librarianship has allowed me to make a meaningful impact on the lives of others. And so <clears throat> uh, when I started my uh, graduate program, um, it was during the peak of COVID-19. And so finding internship opportunities during this time was very challenging and nearly impossible because almost everyone and everything went remote. And so it was really hard to try to find anything that was done in person. Um, but I completed my, de my degree uh, to mid to post COVID. And then I applied over at, at Clovis Community College uh, as an adjunct position. And I was fortunate enough to uh, receive a call back. Um, and then that day marked the beginning of my journey as a librarian. And so I was over there for about a year and a half <clears throat> until I came over to Fresno City. Um, and so it was throughout this journey that I've been fortunate enough to benefit from the guidance of mentorship and the librarians who generously helped me and share their wisdom and expertise with me as well. Uh, their mentorship has been instrumental in shaping my professional development, offering invaluable insights um, as, and as guidance as I na navigate the complexities of librarianship. Um, and just within the short time that I've been here um, at Fresno City, I've been able to gain so much more as well too, uh, working as now as a full-time and really taking advantage of working in committees, associations, um, taking on new roles that I've never would have taken um, before. So it has really allowed me to take these giant leaps of faith um, and really just um, empowering myself as a person with as a career as a Hmong American um, within the field of academics. And that's where I am today. Great, thank you, Tang. And you know, there is kind of like a common theme that I've kind of um, observed from all of your you know experiences that you know we've always all had to get help or support from those around us. You know, and and I think that's the that's the great thing about you know. Um, um, you know, being the positions that we're in, that we get to work with a, a lot of, you know, supportive people. And, and as I mentioned, also like, you know, having this association, these also is also another way for us to support one another, um, you know, and reaching out to, you know, um, each other when we have needs that we may not be able to address ourselves, but, you know, we have, you know, uh, like a device, a diverse group with various experiences that can help one another. All right, so for the second question, um, this one will just be directed to Lorraine and Tang. Um, this one, and uh, we're going to start with Lorraine. So Lorraine, what are some barriers or challenges in pursuing new roles or opportunities for Asian Pacific Islander uh, faculty and um, that you've experienced? Um, I think one of the hardest thing is like being the first. Uh, when I was adjunct, oftentimes I would be the um, sole Asian in, in, the, in the faculty, in the department. And it's, um, it's, it's a heavy feeling to feel that you're not just representing yourself, but your entire people, you know? Um, if you fall, if you stumble, it's like, I'm not just letting myself down, but I'm, I'm also um, letting everyone else down around me. Um, it, it, it's also a uh, different, I think, because, um, there's still that, uh, Asian stereotypes that, um, Asians are in math, science, engineering, and I'm in like one of the soft sciences. So that sometimes is a, a stumbling block. And, uh, also like I, I sometimes, uh, I don't think I do anymore. Um, quarantine completely aged me, but I used to look a lot younger than my years and just like saying, no, I am old enough to be your professor. I, I promise um, that that could be a few obstacles, um, but I think a good way to combat that is like what you said, David, finding your community, finding finding your, your people. Um, I also, I don't know if it's just a me thing, but uh, talking about myself 
um, makes me feel super uncomfortable. I, I don't know why it like, it literally gives me a tummy ache. But um, if I can talk about things that I have done to help my community, I can, I can talk about that a lot better. And I think in academia, we are called to talk about um, what have you done? What have you accomplished? And I, I always find that so, so uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh, David, I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. So yeah, thank you for, for sharing with us, even though like, you know, some of this um, may be uncomfortable. And I think, you know, it's it's not just you, but I think, like you said, it's kind of like you you mentioned um, with like some Asian stereotypes and, and it's not so much a stereotype, but it's kind of like, you know, ways that we've been brought up um, in similar patterns. And so we kind of, helps us, uh, keeps us from, you know, uh, uh, you know, being, um, self, uh, uh, you know, tell, telling, talking a lot about ourselves. And so, um, but yeah, definitely thank you for being able to, to share with us. Um, so Tang, what about you? What are some barriers or challenges that you've, um, experienced? For me, um, one of the first things that it comes to mind, um, just reflecting is probably network barriers. Um, building professional networks and connections can be challenging, um, especially if there are very few or no API individuals in these leadership uh, positions who can try to, say, offer mentorship or even support, um, and which also leads into representation. That's how I've, I've mentioned it earlier as well, too. So it's like if we don't see right if we don't see our own and or in professions up above us it makes it a lot harder for us to even see ourselves being attainable or seeing ourselves within those positions as attaining to get there and so that's why i i find the representation so important um and another one i believe is probably um, access to resources uh, we have very lim uh, very limited access to resources such as funding for, say, professional development, uh, research opportunities, or even, say, support networks tailored to the needs for, say, API uh, faculty um, at, and administrators. So this can, I can see it as highly hindering um, our career advancement as well, too. And so without having the proper budget, we don't, we can't afford to even try to raise our own, right? And so um, just kind of building upon that, just I believe like these two are some of the uh, barriers that I've, that I've encountered. Thank you, Tang. Um, and um, I, you know, kind of refer, uh, reflecting back on the first question, uh, Gurpri, you mentioned about being a mom um, while you were going to school and while you were, while you started working. Um, did, uh, it, it kind of related, it kind of wanted me to think about this question in regards to the, your experience of that. Did, do you, did you have any like uh, cultural expectations as, you know, as being a mother that would like kind of, um, you know, pull at you to kind of say, hey, you know, I need to do, you know, X, Y, and Z because that's what is expected of me. Um, and and if, if so, could you share that with us as being something like a challenge to, uh, you know, your, your journey as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Lots of cultural expectations um, come from a culture that we, you know, women do a lot of the work, a lot of the household tasks. Um, we're expected to act a certain way with our in-laws and our relatives, um, be there at every single event, because if we're not there, why aren't you there? No one really understands you've got a test coming up, a paper to write or any of those things. And so just kind of adhering to doing all of what is expected of me was very difficult. Um, I didn't sleep much. <laughs> I used to have lots of bags under my eyes. It's probably why I've got those permanent dark circles now. Um, I remember with my daughter, uh, I would come into work. My The administrator that oversaw DSPNS at the time was very accommodating. Um, she allowed me to come in a little bit early, take a half hour lunch, take those lactation pumping breaks and you know leave at 3.30 so that I could go to class. But I would come in at seven. I would leave by 3.30. I would make it to Fresno State at four o'clock, attend classes and be there until seven come home, give my daughter a bath, get her to sleep, put all those, you know, bottles into a bag, freezer, um, 
And then I would clean the house up until about 10 p.m. And so it was expected that, you know, my daughter is there and the floors need to be clean so that she's not picking up crumbs that I take care of those things. And so I felt that it was my obligation. So I'd be up until about 10, 1030, cleaning up a little bit, making sure everything was nice and tidy. And then I would do homework and then she'd wake up multiple times in the night. And so, yes, it was very challenging because we're raised and taught to, you know, respect our elders and do as is re required of us in a sense that, you know, we don't want to disappoint anybody. So, yeah, it was very difficult. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, and, you know, um, I, that I brought up that question because it's typically, you know, um, um, uh, women that have these more, you know, cultural, these cultural expectations that are more tied to the home. And, you know, you know, like if as a, as a, as a husband, if I had, you know, with, with kids, like coming home, like my, like you said, like your in-laws or your parents would not expect uh, me to be, you know, cleaning and, you know, taking care of the kids. Like, it's like, oh no, he's, he's been, he's been at, at work all day. He's been at school all day. He needs to rest. But then the same is not true for, for, you know, our, our, our women. And so, um, you know, I'm glad to, to hear you share that similar experience, but then you also, um, you know, were able to manage all of that and still achieve everything you've achieved. And so uh, it goes a great testament to your, your work ethic and your, um, your hard work. Yeah. Um, so, our next question, um, let's start with John. So John, what advice would you have for others um, who want to set off in a similar direction um, in the community college um, that you that you did? Yeah, so my advice to anyone that uh, is interested in, in working for the community college or just higher ed in general um, is to maybe take a similar path that I did, right? I think many of many of us in the, in the panel have mentioned that growing up uh, we weren't really exposed to very many different career options other than maybe like medical lawyer engineering and so uh, taking a leap of faith right to becoming a tutor or just volunteering for um, like an after-school program or uh, getting an internship within higher ed uh, department i think just taking that leap of faith and trying something different outside the scope of what you know and grew up uh, being taught to strive for is the perfect way to get that exposure, the experience. And then the hope is that as you as you're learning and growing along this journey, you're developing skills, you're building a network, you are hopefully leaving a positive impression around the people that you're working with, uh, so much so that you know they're you know willing to kind of pull you in as well, that they see that there's uh, some talent, there's ability, there's um, drive in you to uh, to be successful in this uh, in this industry. And so just, yeah, you really have to kind of just think outside the box a little bit. Um, I just remember being an undergrad and just thinking that, you know, my sole focus was I got to finish my my business and management degree. And then somehow I had to like get into an entry level management position. And so that was literally the way that I thought for the first two years of my undergraduate experience. Like there was no thought of any other um, opportunity being in my future. And again, it wasn't until I just sort of thrust myself into uh, the position as a tutor. That's when when my my mind started to slowly open a little bit more to these different opportunities that do exist out there. And so I think it just takes uh, putting yourself in a different environment. Um, and And if you can't secure like a job or an internship or even a volunteer gig, you know, a lot of professors, a lot of staff, um, they have office hours. They can make themselves available to meet with you, if not in person, then even just, you know, over Zoom. And just to have that conversation, start that discussion. If you have a professor who's um, doing something that uh, you might be interested in, ask to see if you can meet with them. If there's a staff member that you had a great interaction with or a counselor that <clears throat> uh, really felt like you helped them or a librarian that really helped like, or you felt that they, you know, helped you really uh, really well, and you, you're you wondering how they got to where they are, uh, it doesn't hurt to just ask to see if they'd be willing to share their story with you. And that might serve as a source of inspiration for your own journey as well. Great. That's great advice, John. Um, and Gurpreet, what about you? Can you share with us what advice you have? 
Yeah. So in many of our cultures and a lot of what I was taught growing up, we're, we're taught to not really brag about the work that we're doing, not brag about what we've done. Um, stay humble, very humble. And I think I had to un teach, unlearn that in a sense. Um, and it took time. It did. And I had to teach myself that I can still be humble and share the work that I'm doing to help others and to continue to advance and do better and do more for our students and for each other. Um, so that was something that took some time. And what I'd say is, you know what, speak up. We're taught not to speak up, but speak up because you go in and you go, you speak because to speak, to, to fight, um, well, this was a quote that somebody said. They said, you go in and you speak because to fight is to love. And that's exactly how they said it. And we come into the field of education to support our students. Many of us are here because we want to help our next generations do better, become educated and guide them along that process and along the way. Um, at the same time, we should support each other. We need to be sure to make sure we help go support each other, fill each other's cups up as well every so often. Ask your colleagues, hey, what's wrong? Did you need any support? How can I help you? Um, and maybe in turn, they'll do the same for you. And ask our students, you know, what can I help you with? What can I support you with? Um, ask lots of questions. You never know who's going to be able to help guide you in a way that you never thought you'd even go in that direction. I never thought I was going to go into clinical rehabilitation and mental health counseling. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a counselor, but I didn't know that that degree can allow me to be a counselor at the time. I didn't know I was going to go into an admin role, but I knew that I wanted to make more upper level policy level changes to advocate for our students and to support our students and our staff and our faculty even further. I wanted a voice at the table. Um, and we don't have very many voices at the table. So I thought that was important to bring our voice to the table so we can continue to support and advocate for the work that needs to be done. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a culprit of being very terrible at this, but try to find that work-life balance. And it's so difficult. I probably don't practice it well enough myself. Um, I'll tell you with my two kids, my, my daughter's very much like me, that go, 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 let's do this. Let's get it done. We're going to be late. We got to make it on time type personality. My son's a hundred percent opposite. And so looking at him, he teaches me, slow down, look at the sky, look at the trees, look at the bird fly by. And so, you know, Yes, keep going, keep moving, keep advocating, ask those questions, um, find the mentorship that you need and continue along your path, but also enjoy your time while you're doing it. Thank you, Rapreet. Um, so I actually want to address uh, this same question to Lorraine, because Lorraine, you, you shared with us earlier that you um, going into, um, you know, the, the field of uh, history and education was not the original plan at all. And it was like almost like a, a last minute turn. And so can you share with us what advice you have for like, um, you know, getting into the community college system um, as an instructor? Um, I, I think the best advice I could have is um, just bouncing off what Gurpreet and John said, having a community, having a support system. Um, I was lucky enough to find people who believed in me, who helped me navigate through um, uh, getting into community college, who who saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself that, you know, yes, you, you totally should apply for a full-time position. Yes, you can definitely take a leadership role. Um, I think it's also important to turn around and um, be that for people coming in, you know, um, continue that kindness that was shown to us. And um, don't limit yourself. Don't don't think that you you can't do something just because um, you're you're the first doesn't mean that you're you're the only. And um, I I'm just speaking about myself. Um, it's hard for me to advocate for myself, but I I definitely know that I can advocate for other people and my community. And um, it's 
it can be uncomfortable, but sometimes being uncomfortable is good because uncomfortable is challenging ourselves and growing and figuring out like, wow, I, I really can do this. Great. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so, so this next question, I'm going to leave it open to whoever wants to respond, but, um, you know, like with, um, with the, during COVID, we kind of had a kind of more of an influx of, um, um, uh, racial, um, uh, discrimination and attacks against Asian Americans. And so I was just wondering if any of you had, it didn't have to be during COVID, but if any of you had experienced any of that, um, you know, racial uh, uh, discrimination um, through your journey going, you know, coming through um, through school or through um, getting into your career, and 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 can you share that with us? And if it's not too too personal, too hurtful, like how did that help you grow, uh, or how did that affect you? I can share. So growing up, um, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up in Southern California. The school that I grew up in, we had, um, I, I want to say myself and my family, we were the only Sikh Punjabi Indian students in the entire school. Um, my brother is very vis was very visibly, it was noticeable that he was Sikh because he had uncut hair. And so my brother was the boy with the white thing on his head, and I was the sister of the boy with the white thing on his head. Going through school, I mean, I'd looked in through books and didn't find our history. And when I did, it was, well, this isn't what my mom taught me. This doesn't feel right. That's not what happened. It was often incorrect. And so I think I faced um, challenges in just growing up. And I was a very quiet kid, very quiet, kind of often to myself um, because I just didn't feel seen. And we we often didn't see individuals that looked like us up at those top levels. I remember in second grade, I had henna on my hands. My teacher had me go wash my hands about 10 times. Got me back in line, go wash your hands. Why isn't it coming off? Go make sure it comes off. Wash your hands, wash your hands. And I explained, it doesn't, it doesn't come off. No, you need to wash your hands. And so it was difficult. It was very difficult. And my, my dad, he also had a turban. And so once that the 9-11 came around, you saw a lot of acts of um, violence and racial discrimination kind of went up. And so I feared for him because he he works at a 7-Eleven and he's worked at a 7-Eleven his whole life and he's kind of frontline staff there. And so I feared that, well, you know, will he be OK? Is he going to be OK? Yeah, thank you, Gurpri. And it's, you know, it's interesting you sh you share that, you know, growing up in Southern California, and now we don't think of Southern California as being very homogenous. It's like super diverse now. Um, but I mean, there could still be little pockets in that areas where, you know, like you can be the only person of color or of Asian descent in that area. Um, anybody else want to share with us? I'll, I'll share. Um, I used to go running at night um, and when COVID hit, um, when I was walking back home, someone yelled out of the car, uh, Kung Flu, and I just, I my reaction was really dumb. I was like, but I'm Filipino and, and I, I don't I don't know why that was my initial reaction, but it was um it was it was hurtful and it kind of um brought back stories. Um my father grew up similar to you, Gurpreet. He was the only uh Filipino family growing up in Greensboro, North Carolina. And um it just reminded me stories he had uh growing up. And I just I never thought it would happen because we we live in California, like a consistently blue state. And it was it I wish I had gotten mad, but instead like I just had my feelings hurt. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Lorraine. Um Tang or John, do you have do you two have anything you want to share with us regarding this? I don't have much. I think it's because I've been so fortunate to be within the Central Valley that 
the location here, it's always been always a colorful community, right? Um, whether because of, well, I'm not from here, I'm from Merced, California, but even within there, the community itself, uh, there were already a lot of Hmong people that were there. Um, and even growing up, I don't remember any racial attacks. It's just because it was, again, just going back to the community, the diversity that I was in, um, I guess I'm just one of the lucky few that didn't have one of those racial attacks. And so, um, I mean, many others have expressed that they've had, you know, attacks or they've had been racially um, marginalized, but it's just, yeah, for me, I haven't had that. Um, so I guess I consider myself to be one of the fortunate ones or fortunate ones to have not have been in that type of situation. Thanks, Tang. Um, yeah, just uh, if, I, if I could piggyback off Tang a little bit, I think, um, you know, uh, understanding like my privilege as a like as a male person, I think, uh, especially at the height of the pandemic with a lot of um, the the overt acts of violence against the Asian community, a lot of it was targeted towards the elderly and uh, women. And so I think that I was fortunate as well to not have exp have experienced that. I know a lot of those um, acts of violence were experienced in larger cities, with like in subways, uh, on sidewalks, and busy metropolitans. And so Fresno, again, like Tang mentioned, is um, a pretty diverse melting pot. Uh, so I was fortunate to not uh, experience any of the overt um, aggression, but that doesn't mean that that it didn't exist or that maybe all of us didn't quite experience that like growing up and in our own journeys throughout our education and our um, professional careers. And and I just wanted to kind of highlight the point of, um, you know, a term that we've all been probably come across already called the, the model minority myth, right? In that as Asians, you know, the bar of success and the expectation that we're already very high achieving we're already, we come from families that are all, you know, already very successful. And so we don't need a lot of help. Um, I think that misunderstanding and that uh, way of thinking has disadvantaged many of us who, you know, as you've heard, we're going through our own journeys of trying to discover like what would be the best uh, route for us, right? Like we didn't have a clear pathway. We were still experimenting, you know, we weren't, obviously none of us our surgeons, uh, doctors, engineers, right? We're educators and that, and I think specifically our path was uh, one that took a lot of self-discovery, a lot of trial and error to get to. And I think sometimes that's uh, not understood as well uh, because we are Asian, you know, we look Asian and and because we are then sort of stereotyped into this model minority myth of, again, oh, we're already successful. so. I think to a certain degree that has been uh, the challenge, at least, you know, speaking for myself, the challenge in my own journey to uh, to where I am today. Great. Thank you, John, for sharing that. Um, yeah. And thank you to all of you, um, Tang and John, Capri and Lorraine, for for sharing your um, your journey with us and, you know, even touching on some some topics that can be uh, sensitive um, and personal for for you. And so really appreciate that. Um, at this time, we do have uh, some a uh, couple minutes for um, questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the uh, Q&A chat and then we can address them. If you want to have a question to a particular panelist, feel free to address to that uh, to that panelist. Or if you want one uh, for all of them, um, you can just ask as well. Uh, I, uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I just want to thank everybody on the panel again today for for participating um, and also sharing your your uh, your stories with with us. Um, you know, I, I think having this opportunity, having a, a space for us uh, as Asian Americans to come and and share our experiences, we really learn more about each other and. Uh, it really connects us as, as a community to, to be more supportive um, and to really, um, you know, empower each other in, in our positions, especially um, 
since we all work here in the district as well too. And knowing who, you know, who and where our people are at is so important as well too. Uh, and, and being able to rely on each other for that support. Um, I did have one question and this is just open to any of the panelists, but if, if you could give, give advice to yourself or, <laughs> or to any of our, our students about, um, you know, about your academic journey and, and, you know, maybe even your professional careers, what, what, what advice would you give students who are tr still trying to figure out themselves or what path or if they should stay in school or, or just go work full time or whatnot? Um, well, you know, I guess it could be phrased as if you could give yourself, you know, your 20 year old self, uh, some advice, what would you say? I could say to my 20 year old self, don't be afraid to ask questions. I remember um, a piece of advice somebody told me when I, I was young and I was afraid of um, asking or go, I think it was going into an interview and I was afraid, I was worried. Oh, there's gonna be a panel. Um, there's all these people, they're gonna ask me questions. How am I gonna respond? And she grabbed me and she said, they're just people. And it's like the smallest little piece of advice. And it's like, yes, of course, they're just people. I sh it's so simple to recognize that. But the way she said it to me was, don't be afraid, ask. Um, the worst thing somebody could say is say no. And then you just find another path. And it's okay. Um, seek guidance. If you feel like, you know, I'm thinking of going into this route, but I'm not so sure. How does that work? Um, find somebody that's gone through that route or ask someone to help you find somebody that's gone to that into that career and that route and ask if you can shadow, ask if you can learn about their journey, um, ask for an appointment to meet with them, sit with them for half an hour to see if it's the right fit for you. And the worst somebody could say is no. And then you just find another route if it doesn't work out. And, you know, going along that line, we do have a question in the um, Q&A, and it's kind of similar to um, the question that Sue asked uh, about challenges and stuff. So um, the question was, uh, is, was there a time you wanted to give up in school because of challenging courses? And if so, what did you do to complete or to motivate yourself? Anybody want to share that? I'll share a story. Uh, so I took a physics class during my undergraduate uh, years, and uh, the last time I had taken, I think I took the, the physics class during my junior year, and the last time I took any math class was calculus in senior year in high school. And so two years had gone by without any sort of math at all, and to jump into just an entry-level phys physics class even was very difficult, and so... As the the semester progressed, um, I eventually got to the point where I realized that I wasn't going to pass the class. And so it was a very um, eye-opening moment because up to that point, I had passed every single class and I held myself and obviously, you know, my parents and, you know, my family held me to like a very high standard. And so... Uh, fast forward, I ultimately, I mean, I, I went to tutoring. I even um, found uh, some tutoring services. At the time, technology wasn't the greatest, but I was able to find tutoring from India. Uh, and so I really tried my best to find all the resources available to pass the class. But ultimately, I, I just kind of gave up. And I took the F. Uh, and that was the only F that I ever got uh, during undergrad. But then I was able to make up the class because within each, you know, branch of um, courses, there's there's others that you can take. And so instead of taking physics, instead of, of redoing that, I decided to take a chemistry class instead, which I passed with uh, either an A or a B. And so the lesson that I took away from that was, you know, that it's OK to fail, that it's OK to, you know, have all these expectations that you've placed upon yourself kind of come crashing down. But you could always, I mean, you know, they say that when you're down, right, the only way to go is up. And so instead of giving up and just, you know, quitting my entire um, 
collegiate uh, journey, I decided to go just a slightly different path, right? So physics obviously wasn't going to work. So let's try chemistry. And if chemistry ultimately didn't work out, I think geology was another option as well. And so just kind of being resourceful and and, and considering what are some of your other options uh, instead of just giving up entirely. Great. Thanks, John. Did anybody else um, want to respond to that question? Um, yeah. Uh, also answer Sue's question. Uh, I've felt like giving up and facing obstacles so many times, but I think learning perfection is an illusion. Um, we don't have to be perfect all the time. It's okay to fail. Um, failing is not like um, a moral uh, failure. Uh, it's just a class. And like what John said, you there are always options. Um, ask for help. And grades are not a reflection of who we are. And that was one of the hardest things to learn. But there's always second chances, and sometimes things happen for a reason. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, and along the same line, I, I always I always tell this to my my classes, like pretty much every semester. But um, I always tell them that like I failed my first college math class, and like, and so I kind of joke around like, um, I you, I don't know if you want to be in my class because you know like I'm not good at math, but but and you know like um, but it was like you know like that was like college is a completely different experience than being in high school. And so one of the biggest challenges that I found uh, myself trying to deal with was all this extra time, all this free time that I had that wasn't scheduled out for me. I had to do all things on my own. And so um, in order for me to, to help manage myself that I surrounded myself with people that would help me manage my time. And I think that's really important for, especially like, you know, first time college students that if you, if you find that this newfound freedom is keeping you from being successful uh, academically, then there's a lot of resources that you can utilize. And, you know, um, John mentioned like tutoring, um, you can find friends, other, other classmates, um, that will help you, um, you know, study with and things like that and kind of keep you accountable to each other. And I think that's, that's one way that can help you to kind of like, you know, deal with this, this, uh, this freedom, this independence, um, as you're still trying to navigate how to handle it yourself. Um, so we are just about at the end of our time here. Um, and um, so before we before we leave, I, I do want to thank all of our attendees for joining us um, and to learn about our, our Asian American faculty and staff that we have in our district. Um, also want to thank, uh, you know, some of the folks behind the scenes uh, and and on the scene as well, uh, like Sue, um, our, 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 our uh, uh, Ika, Zhang, uh, Susie Nitzo and our interpreters, thank you all for for helping uh, put this um, panel uh, together. And then lastly, and you know, not least, but our panelists for sharing your time and your experience with all of us. And I know that um, I've learned a lot about each of you and uh, I'm glad that you're able to share your experience with us. And hopefully our attendees have taken um, a lot of way that they can utilize in their um, education uh, careers and in their lives moving forward. So thank you all. Are we waiting for uh, Susie to end? <laughs>